Blog Talk Radio. and welcome to The Pink Atheist. I'm your host, The Godless Vagina, and with me today is my co-host, The Antichrist. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's show. Uh, Before we get into this week's show and before we start taking phone calls, I want to do something real quick. I want to say happy birthday to my daughter, who turned 19 this Friday. Uh, Happy birthday, Katie, and I love you. Oh, yeah, happy birthday. That's great. All right. So, and uh, go ahead, Rachel. Uh, you want to tell us about the news that, that we have for this week? Sure. Uh, first of all, the first story we're going to talk about, uh, we have the 11th anniversary of the 9-11 uh, tragedies. Uh, the Trade Center in the Pentagon. Uh, an American atheist has filed lawsuit against the museum for displaying uh, cross found in the wreckage and for more on that let's and Blair Scott uh, Blair are you there? Hey how's it going? How's it Hi, going Blair? Blair? Oh it's going great I mean, other than the fact that I'm watching my Titans and my Saints lose <laughs> <laughs> Yeah 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 I've actually had to put that on hold for the rest of the show so <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you can keep me posted, though. Post some uh, links on the uh, or some scores on the chat rooms, at least so I can keep up with the score. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so you want so, to talk so about how, the World Trade Center cross, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I know that you are uh, you, you have some dealings with this. Can you explain? Basically, what we were looking at is is you know the World Trade Center Commission, which is government funded, along with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the City of New York, etc. A lot of taxpayer money is going into this, um, and they decided to put the cross into the museum. The problem that we have with this is twofold. One, it's not inclusive. They're, they're, they're denying equal access. Um, we, we confronted the museum several times, and, and the government authorities said, look, we'd like to be there to represent the non-religious people that died on 9-11 and they refused. We even offered to pay for it, and they refused. So they denied equal access. So we initiated a lawsuit that basically gave them two options, remove the cross to uphold the separation church state, or provide equal access for not just us, but for anybody in the Jewish faith or any other faith that wants to put a monument in the museum as well. But this idea that it was all Christians that died on 9-11 is just absolutely ridiculous. At least half the victims were non-Christians, be that Jewish, atheist, Muslim, etc. So this was not a Christian event by any stretch of the imagination. And the argument that we get from a lot of people is that, well, it's an artifact, and artifacts belong in museum. Here's, here's the difference between an artifact and not an artifact. There are religious artifacts in the museum that we have no problem with because they're actual artifacts. For example, there, uh, somebody's Bible was burned into a piece of metal. That was an actual artifact found within the rubble. It wasn't venerated. It wasn't objectified. It wasn't worshipped. And that's what separates an artifact from the World Trade Center Cross. The World Trade Center Cross was manufactured, for one. It was not a natural artifact of the rubble. It was venerated, objectified, prayed over, um, you know, worshipped at. It was put into a church for for a while, for, for a long while, actually. I mean, it was it was and is a modern modern modernly venerated object, much like the Shroud of Turin. So when you say let's put the Trade Center cross into the museum as an artifact, you might as well say let's put the Shroud of Turin into the museum as an artifact. And it's just it's not they're not an artifact. It's a currently and modernly venerated religious object of worship. And Blair, uh, don't you feel that it kind of represents our nation as if it were a Christian nation instead of a secular nation? Well, yeah, that's, that's probably one of the big arguments we get, too, is like, well, this is a Christian nation, and it belongs in there. 
And I'm like, okay, one, we'll ignore the fact that we're a Christian nation is wrong. Um, we're a nation of majority Christians, but we're not a Christian nation. The, the, you know, yeah. the Constitution is very clear about that. Um, but this, the second aspect of, of that is this is an attempt, and we've seen this all over the country, to secularize the cross. And it, that has to be fought at every step and every measure, even at the risk of losing a case. That has to be fought. Because when you, you know, look at uh, Justice Scalia, who has said repeatedly that a cross, when it's in a memorial, is secular. It doesn't represent the Christian religion. Well, that's crazy talk, because at this point, if, if any court rules in favor of the secularization of a cross, as long as it's in a memorial, then if a teacher dies at school, all you got to do is throw a cross up and say, no, it's not Christianity, it's a memorial to the teacher. I mean, it's yeah. just absolutely ridiculous, this idea of secularizing the cross. That's what the World Trade Center cross is. That's what the crosses in Utah were. That's what the cross on Mount Soledad is. It's an attempt to secularize the cross by throwing it on a memorial. That has to be fought at every step of the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm behind American Atheists in this lawsuit because I don't feel that we should identify with a cross. Um, you know, uh, as an atheist, I don't want that to be our representation. So. Right, exactly. It's just, you know, there's, another, there's another part of this that a lot of people overlook, too. We, we get accused of, well, you're attacking 9-11 people. You're, you're disrespecting 9-11 survivors and all that. Look, one... I, I, you know, I, I understand the emotion behind it because I was there, okay? I, I mean, I, I wasn't down in Alabama. I was up across the river in Secaucus, New Jersey. What happened? I lived it. I was there, okay? I, it, it's something that means a lot. And so I understand when people were attacking it, but we're not. We're not. We're not. We're crossing a trade center. You're disrespecting so many people that died. You know, the, the yeah. disrespect is not on our side. You know, we, I remember after 9-11, you know, the three or four days passed, and I'm sitting in a hotel bar with a bunch of people watching the news and watching what's going on, and nobody in that room gave one air as to what the religion or non-religion of the person sitting next to them was. Everybody in that room, all they cared about was their fellow human beings, regardless of their skin color, their gender, their race, their orientation, their ethnicity, or their religious background. And that what 9-11 meant. That is what 9-11 meant and what it struck me. Yeah. And let's also, let's also bring up the, the, the issue that this was, a like you said, a manufactured a uh, piece of the building that happened to fall in that uh, that shape, which if you look at it, it was actually bolted together in all those positions. Uh, it's not anything uh, spectacular for it to have fell in that way. Uh, that was It was part of the building. It was part of the rubble. It's we would we would actually argue that it wasn't even part of the building, that it was manufactured in the basement. And, and that it's, the other thing, too, is, a lot of people think it's from the World Trade Center towers. It wasn't. This was actually located in World Trade Center 7, in the basement of World Trade Center 7. So it's not even part of the towers, for one. Um, and the second oh. thing is, when, when looking at the cross beams and the welds, the welds are newer than the cross beams, which means they were recently welded together. Um, and they're welded in a way that cross beams are not welded. If you look at the structure itself, the, the cross beams are sitting at a side angle, where every other intersection in the World Trade Center, they're sitting at a flat angle. So we are, we think, it is our opinion, and we've had engineers come in and look at it, is our opinion that this was actually manufactured in the basement, that it was created by workers, that it wasn't yeah. a natural occurring phenomenon. Um, it, it was, it's clearly been modified and welded. Um, the debris was welded onto it, and they added a substance to it to make it look more rusty than it actually is. I mean, this is a manufactured item, which which goes further against the idea that this is an artifact. It's not an artifact. We do not think it was a naturally occurring item. Interesting. That's why we've got you on, because apparently you know a little more about it than we do, and that's 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 good. I didn't know that. So. No, absolutely. I don't think that they've made that public knowledge. No, they haven't, and and that's you know, and that's. That's fine. Nobody wants to talk about that. <laughs> Why let facts get in the way of faith, right? <laughs> but, you know, let's pretend for a second that it wasn't manufactured. 
that still is irrelevant in, in, the, in the scheme of things because in the scheme of things, it's still an attempt to secularize the cross. And, and the, the funny thing is, is, is the president of the NMCC, a National Memorial Foundation, or an NMSS, National Memorial Foundation, he, was, he admitted that it's a religious item because he said in one of his speeches when, when Father Brian was uh, christening it and throwing holy water on it with Mayor right. Giuliani and, and uh, Governor Pataki right there, government-endorsed religion, hello, he said, we will probably allow other religious items in the museum as well. So he flat out admitted this is a religious item, not an artifact. And he oh. talked about a, a Hanukkah, uh, you know, a Star of David and all that in there. It's, I mean, so they know what it is. So why they're fighting us in the lawsuit and insisting suddenly that it's an artifact? And the museum itself has admitted it's a religious icon. So, what are you going to do? I'll, t- I'll tell you what, our honest opinion is we're going to win this. I mean, we really think we're going to win this case. A lot of people think we're going to lose. We disagree. We think we're going to win. This is a winnable case. Yeah, and I hope we do, and especially with the anniversary of the event coming up here in just a couple of days. Uh, it would be great for us to win that this year. You know you know what bothers me the most about this is is, is from the emotional and human side of this equation. If this cross means as much to people as they say it does, then the last place you want to put it is in a museum where people have to pay to get in to see it and they can only and they can't worship it and venerate it and kneel before it. If this truly means that much to people, then you want it in a public place where people can access it twenty four seven and and express their grief and express their, their their faith towards this object. And so it belongs back in the church where it was, where people could get to it. Putting yeah. in the museum takes a, takes that opportunity away from people. I mean, do they think they're gonna the museum's gonna allow people to hold a worship service down there? You're stripping that. What if, if, you're, if you're saying that this is attached to the cross, by putting it in a museum, you're stripping that ability away from people to access what you're saying it means to those people. Yeah, and definitely we want to keep that wall of separation up. And I, I personally don't want to visit a museum where I have to look at a religious icon as a symbol of suffering and loss. That to right. me just, it degrades it because, uh, you know, I don't believe in that whole woo about afterlife and all of that. So I, I don't want it represented that way to me. I want to, you know, look at the tragedy as it was that we lost 2,976 lives that day. Right. You want a, you want a good example of a secular memorial? Go visit the Oklahoma City Memorial. It, it, it's it's well done. It's secular. There's no religious like, no religious language. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, and it. A great reminder of the tragedy that occurred there and the lives lost. And it is a very humbling experience to go to that that memorial. It really is. And and then the one religious icon that they tried to put in there, the city said no, they can't put it in there. And so a church across the street donated a, a 15 by 15 foot plot of land to put this religious icon on, and that's where it belongs. And that's where the cross belongs, across the street at a church where everybody can go to it without it being on government property. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I have a few uh, questions for you, Blair, the uh, chat line, coming from the chat line. Um, Yeah, let's see. Uh, Well, one of them, I'll I'll let you take this one first. Uh, Why the hell are you so uptight about something so irrelevant? When did the Constitution become irrelevant? (laughs) My point, (laughs) but someone asked the question, I figured I'd let you have it. I, I, I understand. Look, I, I get where that question is coming from. It's just a cross. Well, just a cross is not just a cross. It is a violation of the Constitution of the United States. It is a direct violation of the Constitution. Either we support the Constitution or we don't. There's no so when it when it comes to constitutional violations. There's no such thing as trivial. Absolutely. Yeah, and I figured that would get you riled up. I'd get you riled up before I give you a, a, an easier one. Um, do you have any links for what you were talking about, about the cross being manufactured? Do you have links for that? Any websites? Oh, uh, let me see here. Um, I'd, I'd have to look them up. Um, I can shoot them to you. If you'll shoot them to me, I'll share them to the people that are on this, and uh, that way, you know, they have something to go on after we talk about this. I would, I would venture to guess that the engineering findings are actually probably sealed because of the ongoing case. 
that that may be true. That may be true. But if you have anything, send it to me, and I'll make sure they get it, and uh, we'll go from there. And uh, and Blair, I would say let's let's do this for a second for people who may not uh, know who you are. I know that's hard to be an atheist and not know who Blair Scott is, but. Why don't you give us a, a just a quick rundown of uh, what you've done? What <laughs> I've been an activist for over 20 years now. Um, got involved with American Atheist as the Alabama State Director. Um, then became the National Affiliate Director and then the Communications Director. And now I'm the Director of Outreach for American Atheist. And uh, I also MC the, the national conventions and, and just represent and American Atheist to the best of my abilities. Um, I don't always do it well. <laughs> We're human, <laughs> but it's you know the, the main thing is the, is the activism portion of it. Um, I, you know, I was I started my activism in the Navy and speaking out against the religious claptrap going on there, and continue to do so once I got out of the Navy. And uh, I, I enjoy it. It's something I live for. I, I, I live in Alabama, and people tell me all the time, "You need to move up north." And I'm like, "Nah, I, I love the fight too much. I, if I moved up north, I'd be bored." <laughs> there you go. There you go. And how do, and how do you feel about this? This one's coming from me. How do you feel about? I've, I've heard people say that the South creates some of the strongest and best atheists uh, because we have to put up with the fight so much. Right. Uh, it's, it's you know uh, uh, Richard Dawkins and Chris, Christopher Hitchens. You know they they would comment whenever they came down here that their biggest turnout and their best crowds were always when they came down south. And that's because they're needed here more than they are in New York City or L.A. or Seattle. Um, it, it's one of the reasons that, you know, when American Atheist goes to a larger city for the convention, we get maybe 20, 30 people from that city that show up at the convention. But we go up to Des Moines, Iowa, which is a mid-sized city where we're actually needed. Half the crowd is from Iowa. That, that's, that's the difference. You know, if you look at the number of groups popping up um, you know, across the United States post-2007, where you're seeing the overwhelming majority of groups pop up is small, mid-sized cities in the Midwest and the South, where they're needed. You know, if you're if you're an atheist in New York or an atheist in Seattle, nobody cares. But if you're an atheist in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, or Satsuma, Alabama, you know, people care, and and, and yeah. people, people give you the hassle for it. And so you need that community, and you become a little more aggressive. You know, you can only take so much before you finally just have enough. And, and I, I won't say snap, but you just realize that you have to fight. You have to do something about it. You can only put up with creationism in public school and your kids getting harassed by the junior preachers for so long before you become a, a, a major activist and put up a fight and start to fight back. Yeah. Well, well, Blair, it's been a pleasure having you on. I think we're going to take a few calls. Um, if you If you would call back in if you hear some come up or people stay on hold, we'd appreciate it because we may have some questions come up online for you. I will keep listening. All right. Thanks, man. All right. Thank yeah, you, thank guys. You have for a good joining us, Blair. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Wow. That's wonderful. I love that American Atheist is fighting for uh, the atheist cause. Yes, yeah, and Blair's a great guy. I, I enjoy. He's he's good company too to hang out with. Very funny. Yeah, he um, seems like he knows a lot. So he he does. He he does, and it's it's like I said, he's just fun to hang out with. Uh, to hang out with that guy and drink a few beers, and you're gonna laugh really hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, as we've told everyone, we're gonna do a, a weekly segment on uh, curiosity. Uh, and Ed, that was on last week, is going to be the one who's going to head this up from week to week. And uh, and Ed's on the line with us now. So, Ed, would you like to say something? Uh, sure, Jimmy. Uh, appreciate you inviting me on. Uh, we're going to start uh, this week with uh, a brief update on the status of curiosity uh, up to this point. Uh, right now, we're a little bit better than 34 days uh, into this expedition. Uh, Curiosity has traveled some 358 feet. The United people in other parts of the world, that's 109 meters. It's on its way to a geological feature uh, called Glenic. Uh, scientists are interested in this area because there's three types of uh, geological uh, terrain that 
comes together. So that's where curiosity is headed to this point. But before it gets there, uh, on September 6th, uh, they stopped movement because they wanted to put the robotic arm uh, through its paces. Now, they indicated that this checkout period uh, was going to last about eh, a week to 10 days. Uh, into the beginning of this checkout period, and this is September 6th, uh, they ran into a temperature anomaly on uh, the robotic arm itself. Now, unfortunately, JPL did not give out any details about this issue, but they did come back and say, hey, later on in the day, we cleared it up. Uh, unfortunately, it was uh, too late to uh, continue uh, the test, so they had to delay it until the next day. Uh, that would be September 7th or yesterday. They're putting it through teach points, and, and, and what, what that means is up uh, up to this point, as far as overall operation of this vehicle, they tested it back and forth right here on Earth. But now they're, they're in a different environment, the environment of Mars, radically different. For example, uh, Martian gravity is only four-tenths of what it is here on the planet Earth. So in essence, what happens is they get to go back to square one as far as learning how to operate this vehicle and the other instruments and engineering capacities that it has. So it's, it's going to take some time. Uh, going back to uh, Linux, those three areas, uh, there was uh, there's a bright area uh, just to the north of this formation. Uh, scientists think that's bedrock, and they think it's, 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 it's a nice spot for curiosity to show up there and start drilling into that area and take some samples there. There's another terrain feature that comes right up to it. It has a lot of small craters. Uh, scientists believe that this is maybe an, an older and harder surface of Mars. And then the third feature that also makes sense with, with the other two is the same terrain that curiosity actually landed on. The good news is is that this terrain is undisturbed, whereas with Curiosity landed, uh, the uh, surrounded area was scorched by uh, the red rockets from the sky crane. So that's where it will be moving on to once they get out of these uh, tests and procedures for the robotic arm. Now, on there, uh, we also have a weather report from September 7th. It's not everything uh, that the uh, weather station that's mounted on Curiosity could tell us, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I don't have a time stamp for the, for, for the day on Mars or, or the time on Mars uh, where uh, this information was gathered, but uh, here it goes. Uh, air temperature at the time of uh, this data gather, gathering activity was minus 107 degrees Fahrenheit. Your atmospheric pressure was 7.42 millibars. Winds were out of the east at approximately 4.5 uh, miles per hour. So we're going to be gathering a lot of information from uh, this particular vehicle. And also consider that there have been other vehicles uh, before uh, Curiosity. There's been spirit. Uh, there's been opportunity. And you can go back decades to the uh, first Viking landers. All that data has been processed and is available so that when Curiosity starts uh, coming up with new data, uh, the people at JPL and uh, other folks around the world will be comparing the new data with previous data and see how that stacks up. And what, what that's going to do is going to give us a better picture of Mars's environment. Uh, the exciting stuff is actually going to come later uh, when it approaches uh, Mount Shark, where you have that layered strata there where they believe they can look back into the uh, geological history of Mars. That's going to be some exciting stuff. But along the way, we're going to visit this uh, region called the name Glenig. After that, they're going to make frequent stops and take several samples along the way, trying to get a geological picture 
of Mars is not only as it exists in the present time, but as it, as it exists well as far back as we can go, tens of millions of years. So uh, this is an ongoing, exciting endeavor for everyone here on uh, on planet Earth. And uh, that's what I have for you this week. Back to you, Jerry. Great. Great. Uh, it, it's, it, uh, like I said, I, you're going to take over my uh, segment on curiosity every week, and we appreciate you doing that for us. Well, thank you for asking. All right, Ed. So if you would stay on the line, though, you know we may have some uh, some people that have questions. So just stay on the line, and we'll get to you when we need you. Of course, I'll be here. All right, thanks, Sounds Ed. Sounds great. All right, Rachel, I'm going to let you set up the next segment. Okay. Uh, next we are going to talk about feminism, and I know that we have a couple callers. Um, there are various types of feminism, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to do is, is talk to people about that and let everybody know that while feminism might have different faces and different ideas, we do come together when it comes to equality and rights for women. So. All right, I think uh, I, I, looking at the numbers, I do believe this is going to be one. Let's check into it. Okay. Hi, welcome to Pink Atheist. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Terry. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. Very well, Rachel. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, I know that we wanted to have you on the show to get a little bit of a perspective uh about women's issues. Uh, if we could bring Stephanie on, if she's there. Jimmy? Sure. Thank you for a second. Let me get her on as well. Hello. Welcome to the Pink Cake. Hello. Hi. Hi, Stephanie. Hey. All right. So we're going to talk about feminism, and that's why I have my ladies here with me. Not that, you know, we're anti-men, Jimmy, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, 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 I'm here. I'll, I'll comment if you are. Sure. Um, so, Stephanie, uh, I know that you have a little bit of a different idea of feminism than I do, and I wanted to talk about that live on the air today, um, because even though uh, we do see things differently and have different ideas, I know that uh, when it comes to equality and standing up for women, that we're both on the same ground. And I've talked to a lot of people, and I've heard the it being said that we don't unite, we don't have any, you know, reason anymore to exist and uh, that feminism is very split and and we're not doing anything. So that's why I wanted to have you on today. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what you feel feminism is. Okay. Well, I definitely think that we all have a unity in uh, uniting together for the same position of having equal pay and equal uh, views in society and to not be looked different or looked at as an object. So I think um, when people say that we don't have the same mission and that there's no reason for us to have feminism, I think they're completely um, delusions probably because, like you said, uh, we have different ways of going about reaching the mission, but the mission is the same, to just be seen as people instead of objects and be equal pay for equal work. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think that that's the problem that's going on right now. What we see with the Republicans is a lot of anti-women stances, anti-feminism stances, and the whole dispute about uh, turning over Roe v. Wade and dealing with that. Uh, and I feel that right now is the time when women have to unite again and say, okay, uh, we haven't changed what our direction is and we're really standing for the same thing. So. Definitely. And, uh, Harry, uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, I know that you've been in that position where you've actually had to go through an abortion, and I think that it's a message that we need to get out there that women aren't evil because they go through that and that they're still good people and that they make tough choices. So if you wanted to talk about that. Sure. It, it is a it is a tough choice, and I was at the time that I had my abortion. I was uh, it was right after um, the Supreme Court ruled on Roe v. Wade, and it was 
something that I didn't take lightly. I um, was very young. I was not in a position to care for that child. And I did what what I felt at the time was best for the child. And I, I've never looked back and thought that I was doing uh, an act something that was an act of cruelty or or even morally wrong um it's and it was something i had to do yeah and so i think the, that more, more women should go ahead yes it yes. And, and it's a it's something that really when a woman is in that position uh, it's important that they look at all their options and try to make the best decision, but it's their decision. And, uh, you know, so I think it should be, I, you know, I'm hoping that uh, it's not overturned. Yeah, I think that it would devastate a lot of women's lives if it actually was overturned. And I think it's very vital um, because I know that a lot of the abortions are performed on women who are living in poverty. So we definitely don't want to start that cycle of poverty and abuse and uh, crime raising just because, you know, some people are pro-life and they don't think a woman should have the right to their own body. Well, what I find most troubling are all the people, the people who are pro-life, uh, and anti-abortion, they haven't really looked at the at the big picture, and it's uh, it's a matter too of just caring for that child once the child's born. And with the Welfare Reform Act of 1996, which ratcheted down uh, even further and eroded the welfare safety net. To tell a woman that she's got to have that child and then care for that child, and, but we want you to go to work. And how does that happen? You know, minimum wage is still, I believe, $7 and something, you know. I mean, most of these poor women can only get jobs that pay minimum wage. And I just want to know how they're going to get child care and go to work on $7 an hour and have a place to live and and survive in this country. Absolutely. And one of the things that I think that is important for people to recognize is that it, the determination is it's your body and your right to it. And I don't think that it's right to put women in that position, but also it's wrong to ask them to go through a pregnancy that they don't want to be put into that situation where their body is basically used as, as just something to harbor life. And the Republican Party has made it seem like what, that's all women are is walking uteruses, you know, just right. baby makers. Right. Yes, and and the the problem that I have with that, mentality what well, the republicans are speaking out of both sides of their mouth uh on the one hand they're saying smaller government less invasive government government's too big they're too invasive uh, and and yet and yet when it comes to women's issues it can't be invasive enough uh let's probe you let's you know uh, the vagina probing device in Virginia that was proposed is a perfect example of uh, big government in your vaginas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's just the small section of their invasiveness because I do believe that one governor actually proposed knowing that when a woman has a miscarriage that it was actually a miscarriage and not an abortion um, because then if they – were found to have an abortion, but he wanted to make it a criminal act and, and punish women for having miscarriages. So, uh, right, right, and that's a, and that goes into uh, another uh, very scary um, aspect of the if Roe v. Wade is overturned, is how 
how is it going to be monitored, and what are they going to do? Are they going to prosecute a woman if she does have an abortion? Is she going to be considered a murderer? Yeah, and that actually seems what, like that's what they're going for, is to criminalize women for choosing to have an abortion. And that's where I I think that, though, we, we need to, to draw the line. I... Uh, I think that a lot of the uh, people in, in the religious right and um, on the Republican side um, just have, you know, they, I, I respect a person's right, I'll just put it this way, I respect a person's right to, for personally for themselves to be against abortion. And they should be allowed to feel that way and think that way. However, yeah. however, it comes again down to individual liberties. And uh, I believe that we should have the individual liberty and the right to to our own bodies. Absolutely. I don't think that that should ever be a question, and I never want to see Roe v. Wade turn over. Oh, over time. Right. And you know, and the and the more the further down that road that the Republicans travel and you know, the issue of when does life begin, uh you know, it it, it gets it's going into the bizarre, like the personhood. Um I believe it was Mississippi that was voting on a personhood amendment for the state and and basically saying that um from the time that the woman becomes pre- I mean it, it basically getting almost to the point of where birth control itself should be outlawed. <laughs> yeah, and that's another problem too is that they want to attack our right to birth control um to stop pregnancy from happening and then they want to limit our ability to get an abortion then they want to cut Head Start and every funding that would help women who are living in poverty. And it seems like that what they want to do is manufacture a bunch of people that the society can't take care of and then shove them into the military because that's the only thing that they want to inflate the budget for is military action. Is, so it seems like producing is, bodies right. to go off to war and then, you know, getting them killed ultimately. At least that's, that's what it seems like from all that I hear from their side. Well, that that certainly makes uh, me wonder too uh, why why they are uh, so adamant uh, about this issue, and I quite frankly I don't think that it necessarily has anything to do with with the for the as far as the politicians go, and I, I may I shouldn't speak for them, but I believe that not all of them are take that stance because it's a moral issue. Yeah, yeah. And Stephanie, I know that you're uh, on the line with us as well. Would you like to say anything here? Um, No, I mean, like, I agree with everything that's being said. I guess another thing that plays into it is the guilt that um, is implemented with a woman that does choose to have an abortion. And it's just completely wrong um, and completely immoral to tell a woman that the choice that she made that was right for her life is immoral. You know, it's just a paradox. Well, and and that's one thing that perplexes me is the whole idea of let's not protect the women who are existing now, but let's protect the unborn fetus as long as it's in the uterus, as long as it's, you know, in a woman. And then once it's born, uh, post that, let's not care about it. No social programs for you. So basically it's just that women are walking uteruses you know, uh, and they have to be forced to procreate, whether it's their option or not, whether it will kill them or not. Um, Because, you know, like Ryan and Romney, I know Romney has exception for incest and rape um, and and medical necessity, but like Ryan, he absolutely has no exceptions for that. So even if a woman was going to die from having that that baby, 
and I prefer to call it a fetus. Um, even if she was going to die from that fetus, uh, she's not allowed to do anything to terminate that pregnancy. And that is just that devalues women altogether. That says we are nothing. We we really don't matter to society. All we are is is walking procreation machines. So. Yeah, I wanted to say also you're talk, touching on the military. How there's a irony that they'll send men and women off to the military to fight for these wars that. Um, they don't even know the real reason why we're going off to these wars. And I feel like um, it's it's a link between not being able to have an abortion so they can serve more military, to have a stronger military, that maybe they'll be able to bring these newborns into the Army or into the uh, Navy or such. And, again, yeah. I don't care about their quality of life after born. If the child is not able to be uh, provided for, if they have a horrible life in poverty, the government doesn't care, and the government doesn't um, provide any social services for children or even for single-parent mothers. And it's just, like you were saying, we really are viewed as just a walking uterus to be able to reproduce more uh, soldiers, to be able to reproduce more workers that are getting paid at a minimal wage and getting treated horribly, and we're just a object to them. Yeah, and, I mean, it's clear uh, they want to offer college and, and funding for going to the military. Well, you only see that if you live to see it. And so kids growing up in poverty don't have the opportunity to become educated. And that's like right. offering them the dream, but what they have to go through is they have to live through another unwarranted war. So. Exactly. Exactly. In order for my dad to pay for his own college, he had to become a soldier, and he did not want to. Yeah, and well, see, um, that's Go ahead, excuse me, I'm sorry. Well, I, I just wanted to kind of um, add to that one thing. Uh, while, you know, our planet right now is overpopulated, and I'm not saying, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not leading into that with, uh, yeah, the abortion is a solution to that, but we have an issue with overpopulation. In the United States is one of the, I mean, the biggest consumers of resources and energy in the world as yeah. well. And, I, you know, that it, I just, it just doesn't make sense to me that they yeah. would be forcing more women through, uh, you know, doing away with Roe v. Wade to have children and continue to populate a planet that is, you know, overusing resources and resources uh, and, and resources that are more and more uh, being, you know, the uh, resources that you see... Uh, right now, I got what I'm trying to say is that the disparity between the one percent that has the bulk of the resources and and the 99 percent of us that don't. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, I definitely it feeds into the system. Um, it's just like we're reproducing more consumers to feed into the one percent to keep the 99 percent below. Right. And, and I think it's about the intent. I would say we all agree on that, actually. That, that guy, you know, guys as well. Again, I think uh, Terry was hit the nail on the head. This is not saying that abortion is our, or should be our population control by any means. Um, however, if you're going to fight for or to, or to outlaw abortion, um, it would it would be a lot more convincing if you had a really good uh, environmental policies and other things. And that's the thing they don't. They don't have anything right. for children once they're born, uh, you know, no resources. Uh, once you're born, uh, you're on your own. Uh, right. um, I think I think they use religion as a distraction, and they use religion as like a, a – scapegoat to say this isn't about environmental issues or it's really a distraction to not allow people to think about population control or to think about environmental issues or to even think about the child having a good quality life after this because they just throw religion all over it. The quality of life and a God-created child 
so no one really thinks about the real consequences of what would truly happen to our society, our environment, and our economics if abortion was outlawed, because religion is just such a huge distraction for everyone. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's, that's because it's easy. People who are religious <laughs> don't tend to think for themselves a lot. They tend to follow the leader, and that's the mentality. Um, I'll just do what I'm told. And if you say God in your sentence, obviously it must be true because they don't know anything about their own religion. And so exactly. it's an easy tool for the Republicans to use. And you can tell by their whole convention. I mean, religion was a big part of it. They were selling it left and right. So. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, I think, too, that the Republicans did something very uh, clever uh, and diabolical, really, by um, adopting this as their platform and their issue, because there's a large contingent of voters who uh, personally are against abortion. And again, I have no problem with a person's personal choice. To, to and their belief that it's wrong, I, I and that is their belief, and it's okay for them to feel that way. I and just like it's okay, and it is legal for me to have an abortion, and and my decision is is between me and and it's 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 my decision it's i was going to say between me and my creator but it's it's at the end of the day it's uh it's my decision and that is where i have the problem it's that the religious right is saying no it's not your decision <laughs> Or they, they want to make it that way, right. and the Republicans are taking that platform on because they've got a large contingent of voters that will be single issue voters. They, they, this religious right will vote on that issue only, uh, knowing that even knowing that the person they're voting for is not the best person for the job. Mm-hmm. And just because it's uh, legal, just because abortion is an option, isn't forcing everyone to have an abortion. So like you were saying, of course, if a woman wants to personally be against it, of course, but as soon as her personal opinion becomes detrimental to the society, then it, you know, then it's no longer an opinion. Right. And, uh, and if you look at uh, the Republicans, they don't have much else in their social programs. They don't have really anything to offer. They can't even tell you what they're going to do once they're in office. They keep saying, ask us, ask us after the election. Well, after the election, what you're just going to do is the same thing that got us into this horrible deficit that created the, this semi-depression that we're in and is going to make a life worse for all of us. And you can see by the, the state laws that are passing everywhere that they don't have anything good to offer. They don't know what they're doing as far as, as taking care of the United States and the policies. And uh, Bill Clinton made some interesting remarks in his speech uh, about, you know, the plans of the Republican Party and their, their ideas of how to run government. Mm-hmm. I just think that they're trying to sell us a bill of goods based upon attacking the weakest of society because when it comes to women, when it comes to homosexuals, you know, we're not the leading majority and there's so many pro-life. So it's easy to attack, uh, you know, people who aren't the majority. And I think that that's what they're doing to distract from the fact that they have no platform to stand on. Definitely. Right, right. Well, it's, you know, an, another uh, attack that I see being waged and it's coming from the religious right and some of the organizations, they uh, are continually trying to interject the concept that this is a Christian nation, that this nation is, uh, you know, all about God, whether it doesn't, doesn't matter what, you know, church you go to, um, but this is, you know, this is not a Christian nation. 
No, and and that's what we were saying to Blair Scott, um, is that it's not a Christian nation, and we don't want to be represented by uh, religious doctrine. Uh, Our Constitution is set up to keep religion from invading in state affairs, and everything that the Republicans are right now is a dogmatic stance. They want, and that's why they don't care about the environment. It's all about the religion. They believe in their dogma, and they want to lead us with dogmatic notions. And that's absolutely horrid for those of us who are atheists and don't believe in a creator. Um, And we want to have our say-so in public policy as well. And that's the origin of the Constitution, was to make sure that everybody had a voice and representation. And, uh, you know, it's amazing that we're in 2012 and they're trying to destroy something that was created a few hundred years ago by men who had more intellect and, you know, more vision for our country than the men that exist now do. And I find it appalling. I don't want religion in schools, in public places. I want religion where it belongs, in churches and homes and kept private and kept away from me and what I believe personally. Right. Well, Blair Scott just commented a good point. He said, why take care of the earth? Jesus is coming back, so... <laughs> yeah, right, right. That's the theory that they're they're motivated by. Jesus is coming back. He'll save us. He'll take care of the planet. Well, you know, your Jesus has been gone for a few thousand years. Uh we really wish you'd get over it. So <laughs> I mean you can wait fifty thousand years for that Jesus to come back. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hmm. Well, do y'all want to take some more calls? Uh perhaps we'll have some questions for both Barry and uh Stephanie. Absolutely. Um, if I could say something, um, I think that it might be a little distracting to, to bash the Republicans completely about this, because if you look recently, the Democrats haven't been doing a, a very good job at protecting social programs. They're they're bailing out banks and auto companies, and um, even Obama, he's planning on cutting um, social programs with his with his uh, with his tax programs and economic programs. They they seem to only support social um, progressive ideals whenever the majority of the country also agrees with them. Um, I feel like uh, they're if they were if they were really focused on feminist and women, they would refuse to cut social programs. They would refuse to um, I mean to do all these very very conservative things that they are doing, like the, the Obamacare program. Um, it seems great, but why not just go to a single payer health care? Uh, why well, don't they why don't they give women maternity leave um like they do in foreign countries? Um the reason, you know, abortion is so caught on the conservative side is because yeah, it would cut off um a flow of cheap labor force. It would um you know, do all of these things which would ultimately for big business. And the Democrats, you know, they they don't look so much different on social programs. They, they'll throw us a bone sometimes. They'll throw women a bone, but they they never really go full out on social things. Um, I, I, I would I would I agree with you, uh, Mark. I agree with you a hundred percent on what you just said. Um, I, I would say that, you know, you know, I spoke about this before. Um, you know, it is choosing the worst or the best of the two evils. Uh, we agree on that. Um, and, you know, if we had a really good, uh, I guess you would say a socialist uh, candidate that had a chance, I think you would have uh, a, a tremendous amount of us standing behind it. Um, the reason that I personally go for Democrat is because it is, I would say the better of the two, um, and yeah. only better by a small margin. I agree, but uh, but it is better. I think the reasoning of bashing the Republicans is because of how much they bash feminism. Uh, the Democrats might not be supporting us, but they're also not coming out saying that women can turn off their reproductive systems when they're raped. So I think there's a lot of hostility towards Republicans because of how outwardly spoken they are at insulting our reproductive system and insulting women on a general basis. Um, And just to everyone that's listening, if you don't want to vote for the lesser of two evils, you should definitely vote for Jill Stein. One of the great 
does want to do for women is provide single parent health care. Um, she also wants to do amazing other things. So if anyone is sick of the two party system, definitely look up the Green Party candidate, Jill Stein. Um, and if you're a feminism or a feminist, that's even more of a implication to do so. Yeah. 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 I, th- uh, I would. I would say 100. percent Yeah. Uh, however, you know, go ahead. There's, there's a huge uh, lash out against Republicans because of how outspoken they are against women. You know, so it's just relieving to bash Republicans because of how much they bash us. Yeah, it is. It, yeah. It, it, you know, picking the picking the good target of that. <clears throat> well, and I think that we have to look at this really realistically. Um, when it comes to the two party system, we are kind of deadlocked into that because there's not enough people to look at a third party. And so it is picking the lesser of two evils. And we also have to remember that Obama was surrounded by a lot of aggressive Republicans in Washington D C who shut down a lot of government movement. They fought him at every turn. So that is part of why things haven't gotten taken care of, and that's why we've seen him give in so much um, and why he's made those social spending cuts, because he's had to give and take. I mean, it hasn't been everything thrown at his feet and he gets to do what he wants. He still has to deal with everybody else in Washington, D.C., and uh, negotiate what he can actually get done. Right. Jill Stein for president. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I agree. We need uh, we need to have a third party. I think that breaks the monotony. But unfortunately, um, people thinking for themselves doesn't happen a lot. They do vote one ticket item. They do think That's- as far as one thing that they're really concerned about, even if it's never going to be voted on, they will vote for that candidate based upon that ideology. Yes, yeah. Um, and another thing is that our vote is just a representation of what we want. So if there's things in Obama's uh, policies that you don't want, then by voting for him, you're still representing the things that he's running, even though you don't like it. So I think, again, I just, I'm just i going on like a little campaign soapbox opera, but, uh, again, voting for Jill Stein would be such a symbolic representation that we're sick of this two-party system and we're sick of the big business. You know, it's just the coin, it's the same coin, just two sides of the, of the coin. Um, so, yeah. yeah. But but we are here for feminism, so we might want to stay on track. <laughs> <laughs> well, politics is part of it, too. I think we're on track. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely, because I know that the next thing that we were going to talk about is religion and politics and that influence and what each of the candidates believe. So we're still on track. We're doing good. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> And, Jimmy, if you wanted to take some more calls, uh, that would be great. Yeah, hang on one second there, Stephanie. Hello, and welcome to the Pink Atheist. Hi, Jimmy. Hi, how are you doing? Good. I'd like to thank you and uh, the Pink Atheist crew, Stephanie Blair Scott, and uh, all the atheists that are making noise and... uh, relatively rapidly changing this world for a better place. The most recent poll I read is over 30% of the world are non-believers. And um, getting back to the the feminist issue, uh, I wanted to address the fact that I think that men really need to get on the side of feminists. They don't have to call themselves feminists if they don't want to. This all fits within the humanistic principles, uh, equal rights. Uh, I, it, legislation informed by indoctrination is just an absurdity that I I can't wrap my head around. It's birth control rights determined by people who believe in the Virgin Mary. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like expecting Charlie Sheen to be cleaned up by going to the Lindsay Lohan rehab condo. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, right, right. And it's it just, you know, these people like Todd Aiken who, you know, he, he says that uh, uh, women can't get pregnant uh, via a rape because a doctor told them that. Well, who reaches the age of Congress where you can be in Congress where you wouldn't question that kind of thought? There's no, 
skepticism, no rational thought around. It's just, I'm an American, I'm pro-choice. And if I need to be, I'm a feminist, I'm a humanist. Uh, I, this dominion over anybody's body, it just, <clears throat> you know, or it, it doesn't stop with women. And it hasn't stopped with women. It's a slippery slope that uh, starts with a, uh, a moment of prayer before a council uh, meeting. It turns into a national day of prayer. It turns into Rick Perry's prayer of Palooza. And, yeah. you know, it's going to be, and then it turns into the year of the Bible in Pennsylvania. And, and it doesn't stop at women because... Uh, and not just the fact because men have sisters and daughters and mothers and aunts. It's because we won't have end-of-life issues uh, when we're sick and in pain and because the religious people, you know, w- wouldn't uh, uh, let medical doctors uh, go through with their stem cell research so that I might have a cure or at least have my pain allayed. Uh, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's it's not just a women's issue here, and no, men really no, need not. to know that. You know. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, and, and I'm and I'm one that does stand up for for women's rights, and and you're right, it's not just women's rights. Um, by the same token, when we do this, we're uh, accepting the stem cell research and allowing uh, science and technology to move forward. Um, something that my friends know about me, I stand behind uh, very strongly. I have someone close to me who's uh, been a benefit of some stem cell stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, that's my issue is, is is it's not just, like you said, it's not just a women's rights issue anymore. And uh, and we should we should shine some light on that. And I, I would like to see more men stand up for, for women, for their sisters, their aunts, and their moms. Like you said, it's it's we need it. Agreed, and it's you know it's not the, the religious people want to have their ridiculous beliefs. That's fine; they can believe in whatever they want, but uh, they can't tell me what to do with my body. I can't tell uh, anybody <laughs> what to do with their body, and it, it just uh, you know for the uh, it's so absurd for the uh, the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church to be against abortion. I think the only reason why they're against abortion is because they consider abortion to be a form of cock-blocking. They're not getting (laughs) fresh meat to get raped. They need new kids in the onset batter circle. It's sick. I mean, right. I just said, uh, yeah, uh, thank all of you. I hope I hope that you turn into a TV show and you're on every day of the week. And uh, <laughs> I, I wish the best for, wish the oh, best thank for you. you and yours. Yes. Thank you. And yes, thank you very before much. Before you go, I just want to say one thing. Uh, I wrote this blog a while ago, back in March when I got home from the Reason Rally. And I've said it before, and I'll, I'll keep saying it. I didn't choose to be born with a uterus. Um, it happened by nature, by evolution. And so I don't feel like that should be used against me. I didn't ask for it. I didn't buy it. I didn't go to the state to license it. And I don't think that anyone should ever tell me what to do with my body because basically all of the choices that I make in my life, it it affects me personally. And, you know, I think abortion is one of those choices there. It is very private. And every woman has to, you know, rationalize to herself, why she's doing it, and what it means to her to have an abortion. And I don't think that anybody from the outside looking in could ever, you know, walk in the shoes of that woman and, uh, you know, understand her decisions. So I really don't appreciate the government trying to intrude upon uh, my uterus and my choices as far as reproduction goes. So. Very nice. Well said. And thank you once again. Oh, thank you and for thank joining you, us. Thank you for the call. We appreciate it. All right, let's take another caller then. All right, sounds good. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the PA. Hey. Hello. Hello. Hi. You didn't warn me again, Jimmy. 
Well, I uh, tried, tried my best. But... <laughs> yeah. Well, clearly your best isn't good enough. Give me step it up. Step it up. <laughs> How you doing? Uh, we're, we're doing fine. How are you doing, Carlos? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Um, I actually wanted to touch on the most recent conversation about the whole um, feminism and, and women's rights and abortion and whatnot. Um, I, I'm at a personal... Per, okay, as far as my personal life, I don't tend to make it too personal where I don't share my feelings and my thoughts, especially my own personal um, experiences. Uh, unfortunately, um, I, at one point or another, had to, uh, my wife, um, uh, you know, get an abortion, and, uh, actually my ex-wife, rather. And uh, taking her now, it's uh, not not an easy experience to go through, not even as a father, uh, especially since her and I already have one son in common. And I was actually looking forward to another one. Uh, but that's besides the point. What I want to know, what I want to say is that whenever I speak about something, generally it's from experience. And as far as uh, constitutional rights go, uh, well, we should always seem equal in the eyes of politics and government and, and in the law. Uh, there's a clear-cut amendment standing that, in, that indicates that we cannot outlaw abortion, that we cannot bring back the whole, you know, uh, pre Roe v. Wade, and that's very simple. You look at it this way. Um well, where do we stand on that? How do we look at it? Okay, well, very simply, we've got to go and say, does does anybody at all ever have the right to tell you what to do unless it is where you are infringing upon the liberties of others? No. What? Okay. Well, if someone does tell you what you can and cannot do with your own body, is that not slavery? It is. Okay, especially because the government, remember, that's the whole idea. The whole idea is that the government is, is now telling you what you can and cannot do with your own body. Uh, well, if that's the case, then we already have a standing amendment that keeps the government, or anybody else for that matter, uh, local government, state government, federal government, or even a private person, from uh, telling you your property. And that property is the 14th and 13th Amendment. We have an anti-slavery law already, so... When it comes down to it, it's not even just, it's not even about, you want to bring legality into the issues? So if they want to start ripping apart the, you know, our constitutional rights just to get things done, um, then we're not going to have a government. And I think, in my opinion, people are forgetting that politicians do not make the government. We are a democratic republic, and we have, you know, the, the power to remove people. And it drives me insane when you have people who say they have one-on-one conversations with God, and, you know, you have government sitting there, you know, with their hands in their pockets, the thumb of their ass. But the minute, it can got, but the minute one other president says he got a blowjob, they want to impeach him. Yeah. Well, uh, so, just, just to let you know, Carlos, I brought uh, t- uh, Terry and Stephanie both back on the line because you are talking about subjects that they were discussing. So welcome back to the to the show, both of you. Hello. Yes. Oh, hello, ladies. Um, no, well, I, I want to let you guys know that I am I am pro um, pro choice, but what I want to stress out the fact is that let me um, let me explain something very clear. Just because I'm pro choice doesn't mean that I think that it should be a scapegoat. And I think that you ladies understand what exactly what I'm talking about. And unfortunately, the youth today, and now with the uh, lovely uh, song lyrics becoming a way of life, you know, henceforth YOLO, which is ridiculous. Um, you have these girls who are going out and they're having sex and they have the money to get themselves an abortion. So what do they do? They use that as a scapegoat. And I, think that um, I want to address this here because a lot of men say that and it, it really twerks me. Um, using it as a scapegoat or a way out. When it comes to getting a doctor's exam and birth control, the cost is minimal. I mean, uh, it, it's not so overwhelmingly expensive. And I think that uh, I don't know what the cost of an abortion is. I think it's around 350 to $400. That's an expense. And I don't see women choosing to just have abortions like every month, okay, I'm going to go get an abortion. And it is devastating for a woman's body. I mean, there are medical tolls that it takes on her. And the number of cases of women actually using this as a method of, quote, unquote, birth control 
is little to none. I mean, there are just a few recorded cases of this. Most women wind up in a situation where it's a necessity. It's either rape, uh, incest, uh, a bad relationship where the relationship has ended and they know that they're not going to have the help and support that they need. They're in poverty, uh, and, and it's basically a bad situation for them to have a baby. So women don't just use this as an easy way out. I mean, I a lot of women have that conscious. Yeah, and, uh, well, but I have heard that from men and uh, a lot of men, actually. And it, so it's what, obvious what I want to stress is, Okay, what I'm trying to stress is that even if there is, let's say it's not the majority. Let's say it's not even, you know, 10%. Let's just say we're giving you some random number here. Let's say 5% of women decide to use it as a, uh, as a method because they choose to or they can't handle on uh, birth control or they don't, have, they don't like the idea of remembering to drink damn pills or putting on a condom because it's just simply because it doesn't feel good. Um, you're all women like that. And I live in Miami-Dade County. I live in the party capital of the world. There are women here that are trying to say, as well as men, and you're just assuming that people actually have a lot of forethought when they think about these kind of things. They're going to go out to have fun. They're going to get drunk. They're going to fuck. That's, I'm sorry to use that language, but they're going to fuck, and they're not going to care who's wearing what, who's drinking who, and what is going on. So at the end of the day, the, the lack of forethought is the idea here. And you, you're, giving, you're giving women and men, or anybody else, I even give men, um, way too much leeway as far as their common sense. And remember, common sense isn't that common. Well, and uh, I just want to clarify what we're really debating about. I guess, like, Carlos, are you saying that abortion is an excuse to go act promiscuously? No, 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 no. If you personally cannot handle a child, I personally would want that child aborted as opposed to being stuck in another system where likelihood is where they're going to be abused and used and, 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 and just pretty much tossed around the system until they turn to the age of 18 and they let go, and now they become a burden on us once again. What I'm trying to say is you have the right to do with your body as you please. But remember, if you feel that you're not ready to be a parent, I'm going to tell you something right now. If that's the only reason why you say that you're not ready to be a parent emotionally or psychologically, or anything for that matter, then you have a really bad view of the world because no one is ever ready to become a parent. I can tell you right now, being a parent is you learn on the go. You have to. You can't take your life lessons from before and adapt them to your child. You have to grow as a person, and you actually learn more from being a parent and from the child itself, and that's how you become a better person. That's how you grow. But the problem is nowadays you have people who are throwing themselves at the mercy of, of, people, of clinics and ideas that just because of the fact that, well, you know, I'm not ready to become a parent. Or, you know, maybe they're not using it as an escape though, saying, oh, well, I'll just get an abortion and that's it. Maybe they're not using it exactly in that sense. But the idea is, fine, at 26 weeks after conception, this thing is now becoming sentient. It can now feel pain. It can now do a lot of things like recognize sounds and, and, and feel things. And we know this based on biology. But the idea is that after 26 weeks or after 30 weeks or the 40, whether it was at one day or at 100 days in or 300, you know, whatever it could be, you have to understand it is a life. In the making. Okay. But the if, making. Okay. So be, be if responsible. Be responsible. Hold if on, a woman, let's let, let Stephanie talk. If, if a woman says that she's not psychologically or emotionally ready for a child and then goes ahead and has a child, wouldn't that then lead to the child having a horrible life? If the parent wasn't even interested in it before, then the parent is more likely to not be emotionally attached to that child if they emotionally weren't ready for it. If the parent wasn't psychologically ready to have a child, then the parent wouldn't be psychologically devoted to that child. And as far as, like, it becoming a human after a few weeks, well, that is why there's a cutoff date for an abortion. Um, maybe I should do more research into what the cutoff date is to have an abortion, what the legal cutoff date is. But to say that they're using it just as a scapegoat because they're not emotionally ready, I don't think that's a scapegoat. I think that's a valid point. If they're not emotionally ready or stable to have a child, then, yeah, they should have an abortion because then that child wouldn't get the emotional attention that it deserves. That child wouldn't get any psychological attention that it deserves. And okay, it then would the say the father is concerned. It would be abused emotionally or be abused and neglected psychologically. 
Okay, but you're assuming that this child is going to become abused sexually, psychologically, whatever it could be, just because the mother isn't ready. What what what, what is the key to stepping up and saying I'm emotionally hand, uh, capable of doing these things? So I can raise a child. Because I can tell you right now, I, I have a father. I have a three year old. I, I would kill and, and, and do whatever I need to do to make sure my son re- is is you know raised correctly. I don't hit my child. I love my son. He gets technology at his disposal. My son's a genius. He's loving. He's caring. And you know what? The sad part is. His mother is not the greatest mother in the world, but she's still his mother. And neither one of us really prepared for what was going to happen. But we weren't. We don't abuse him. You're assuming that he's going to be abused or she's going to be abused Hold just on. because they're born into a loveless family. Hold on. Okay, let me step in here for just a second. Okay, Carlos? Um, okay. I want to say this. Now, there is a difference between not being being a little scared to be a parent and being in a bad situation and being as scared to be a parent. And it's hard for us to determine what is going on in someone else's mind. I mean, you can't, you can't assume why women are having abortions. And I don't right. think it's right to make that assumption because that assumes that they're just irresponsible people and, and they <coughs> just are making it out of a, a, a rash decision. And we can't do that. I mean, basically, abortion exists because uh, you know, accidents happen, and I don't want to be the first one to judge why someone else is doing it. What I want to say is that they're allowed to do it because it's their body, and we don't yep. have the right to judge what everybody else does. That's inappropriate. Gonna, I mean, and yeah. which, you know, that's what Christians do. That's what the religious do to women. They say you're having abortions because you're irresponsible, because you don't want to have that child no, and, no, no, and no, be no, the no, responsible no, no, no. being you Hold should on. be. As well, soon as you on say the basis, somebody you're the going ahead of your body. It's on the basis of it being your body, women, do what you want. The exact same way I will do what I want in my body. I will, I'm a human. I believe in human rights. The equal right is, is, is essential for the survival of our species. We have to be able to do what we feel as long as we don't infringe upon the rights or the lives of others. It's perfectly fine. What I'm telling you, on a psychological standpoint, on a, on a viewpoint of how to look at the world, you don't know whether you, that life you're going to terminate today might be the person who changes the world tomorrow. So since we have that kind of, we have that uncertainty principle, which is technically it's the quantum mechanics of childbirth, okay, it is until it isn't, and it isn't until it is, okay, you have to look at it as, is this the right decision to do in the grand scheme of things? We have to look at life as utilitarian. We can't look at it as a, unfortunately, you know, this, this, this hedonistic view. But the idea that it's your body, if that's all the, all the idea that you want to be based on, then that's fine. That's perfectly good. I have no problem with it. Do what you feel like. What I can tell you right now is, thankfully, thankfully that I was not aborted when I was, you know, you know I, I, when I was in my mom's you know, room. Uh, it kind of sucks because I'm going to be honest with you guys right now. Uh, I've been HIV positive since birth. That's 27 years now. Okay, I'm actually number six in the world to have this disease since birth in the 80s. I survived. My son's clean. My ex-wife is clean. Okay, I've had a very productive life. I've had a lot of shit come in my life. But you know what, though? A lot of the pain and suffering I went through would have been obviously avoided if I would have been avoided. But the idea is the fact that I didn't. I have changed people's lives. I, I mean, I do speeches. I'm writing a book. I mean, I, I do astrophysics at FIU. I'm looking to change the world. I want to ask you a question, how, Carlos. I want to ask you a question. Okay. So you assume, and this is what people do, automatically assume that you just killed another Einstein by having an abortion. Um, how many prisoners did you kill? How many uh, people that would have grown up to just be minimum wage workers? how many people that would have grown up in social injustice, how many of those would have lived a horrible life? Because I've seen and, women and in that these is situations. A beauty, and that is a beauty on, of life. Please, please. That's a beauty of life. Let me finish. I've seen women in these situations. Not every baby is going to turn out to be an Einstein, and that's a fact. The fact is that opportunity, education, and, uh, you know, the right genetics make you that genius. But that is not always going to be the case. Some of those would have just grown up to be somebody living in a trailer at minimum wage, not doing very good, and not helping society. So 
I think, you know, to, to put that out there like that is just wrong. It doesn't do justice to women who face that. Yeah. Okay, I, and I, I, I agree with you. You don't know who's going to be the Einstein and who's going to be the guy who's hanging out underneath the bridge. But see, that's the idea of life. The idea of life is the uncertainty. The uncertainty of everything. You have, but you can't live under a bridge. Uh, you know, with your, you know, balled up into a corner and saying that, you know, leave me alone, make the bad man stop. Life is about the uncertainty of things. You cannot determine, and no one here is capable of determining who's going to be the good kid or the bad kid goes up. You know, you don't know if he's going to be a mass murderer, you know, or he's going to be the person that keeps world. And in the event of Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer was not a mass murderer. By indirect means. He did, in fact, change the world. So you don't know who's doing what, who's doing this for that. Or, see, that is life. And life Can is chaos. Can I intercede? Um, the, majority of the majority of statistics of women that go to have an abortion are all, sadly, uneducated and already are in the poverty line. So when you bore this child into an environment that is probably going to be uneducated, it's not, they're not going to turn into an Einstein. The, the, the genetics of intelligence, but the conditioning is far more important than genetics. Because if those genetics aren't stimulated, and if those brain cells that are already an Einstein brain isn't stimulated, then he isn't going to become an Einstein. So it doesn't matter if this genius is born into poverty. They're probably not going to have the chance to change the world. And, like, I understand the whole uncertainty thing, but I think you really are making a lot of assertions that you don't have the right to because it's all a problem. What is first ever made to? I've been not, I haven't been absolute for anything at all. You're, you're, you're putting work on my family. I have nothing to do with that. Hold on. I'm, okay. Uh, Carlos, I'm not uh, I'm talk. <laughs> Carlos, I do want to address one thing. Uh, here's the deal. There's 7 billion people on this planet. That's 7 billion mouths to feed. Uh, every day in Africa, 14,000 children die of starvation. So yep. what is the value of life? When we talk about abortion, what is the value of life if we can't save a starving child in Africa? How dare we say that one being not born in America has more value than the ones that are starving to death? You know, exactly. that's placing too much value on the life that, that – could, quote, unquote, be Einstein versus the Einsteins that are going to starve to death today. Okay. Exactly. That's because if, exactly if, that's your, yeah, if that's your premise, then there's probably 14,000 Einsteins we need to save today before we talk about the one that isn't going to be born. Exactly. I there agree with that. Yeah, exactly. Hey, but you um, Stephanie, Stephanie, hang on one second, if you would. Um, uh, we're getting quite a bit of feedback because you're on speakerphone, I do believe. If you could take us off speaker, we'd appreciate it. Oh, sorry. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. My phone's not working. And Terry, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, chime in any time you any time you want because you're on you're on the air with us. Well, you, you know, it's it's really uh, this whole discussion is is very delicate, and there are arguments on both sides of the equation. Um, but I, to the, to the point that, Rachel, I believe you were making about children in the developing countries, um, you know, we look, at the, we look at those countries and we go, my God, they keep having more babies. They keep having more kids. They're starving. That's why they're starving, because they keep having, they keep overpopulating. They can't take care of the children that they're having. And, you know, and, and then here, we're, there's a, a push to force women to have more children, you know, by, by the uh, Republicans and the religious right. Yeah. And, you know... Should a woman have an abortion or or not? It is a very personal decision. It should not be entered into lightly. They should look at, at other options. Adoption is one option. Uh, and the the decision to end that child's life was it right or wrong? You will never know. We will never know. That's a Absolutely. fact. 
and you, so we can't presuppose that that might have been the next Einstein or not. I mean, that's root, that that is ridiculous. It could have been the next Hitler, for all you we know. <laughs> so yes, it's ridiculous to speculate. Uh huh. And exactly. and what now? Using it as a form of birth control, I don't think that too many women endorse that. Mm-mm. Um. Because oh, no. it is a it's a traumatic experience to have an abortion. It is not a fun time. It's not, hey, let's go to the abortion clinic. <laughs> and it's a it's a very, very serious thing that a woman has to contemplate. Mm-hmm. And and I don't think that most women look at it and contemplate it with with a light heart and and um just the spur of the moment uh thing. Yes. So it's a it's a lot to contemplate. I've been on both sides. I've had an abortion, and within a year, I got pregnant again. And I didn't have an abortion that time. And this is a variety of reasons why I chose not to have an abortion the second time. One was guilt. And I felt guilty because I had one already before. And I felt like, okay... All right, give the child up for adoption. That was my option, and that's what I chose to do. And I don't regret that either. Yeah, very well put. And see, this is the thing. We can't assume that women are out there being irresponsible. This is why there is such an uproar right now, because people are pushing this notion that us women don't know how to take care of our own vaginas. I am very mm-hmm. responsible with mine. I decide when and if I'm going to have a child and not until. And I'll tell you what, I have said it before and I'll say it again. If I ever was put in that position where I was facing being a parent alone, uh, working a dead-end job, and living in poverty, I would have an abortion because it's not fair to do to those children. And it's true. You're not going to come out to be Einstein unless the stimulation is there, unless that happens to exist that you have the right genes. So let's not assume that everybody's Einstein, and let's not assume that they're Hitler. Let's just assume that this is a child who could possibly live through some horrible things if you put them in that position. And I've seen a lot of people in poverty with children like this, five or six children that they can't really care for and can't be highly educated. And those children wind up in that same vicious cycle, and it's not fair to them either. And, and Rachel, can I say one other thing? You know, at the time that I was pregnant and I had the abortion, I was 15 years old. And I didn't, you know, I I can't even remember the circumstances or anything. I just know that it happened. And uh, I was very young. I was too young to... Uh, start becoming a mother. I didn't, I I had no sex education. I knew nothing about the pill. I knew nothing about trying to prevent pregnancy or not given an option to prevent it. And, uh, and, And I was told basically the same thing that a lot of the religious organizations want you to do, and that is abstinence, which is, uh, didn't work for me and it didn't work for, uh, um, Sarah Palin's daughter, either. Mm. Yeah. And and so um, it, at that age, to have gotten pregnant, had an abortion, and then shortly afterward to get pregnant again, says more about the fact that uh, I didn't have the proper education and, in particular, sex education to help prepare me and 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 help make me aware of the possibilities and the potentials. And it was uh, for a very young person. Uh, it's just something that happens because they're they're not prepared at, at 15 years old. I just didn't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, if I could say something, too, uh, I was really going to touch on the education thing and how much that would prevent even the abortion um, possibility coming up because I went to a Catholic school, so they our sex ed was abstinence as well. <laughs> our sex ed was to just not do it. And the fact is, is that we are animals and that drives us. And um, 
the fact is is that if we had uh, birth control implemented into our system and into our insurance, I think the abortion um, situation would lessen a whole lot. There would be less abortions if there was more birth control available to right. all women. And I especially agree with that too. educated on it. Well, and, and I think that's what we need to do is get young people educated about birth control and the methods and how to protect themselves because it's not just abortion that, that happens. We're talking about women in the situation where uh, when you teach abstinence and then children are ignorant to what can really happen to them, they don't know about sexually transmitted diseases and how pregnancy mm-hmm. happens and how to prevent all of that. And we have a responsibility to young women, young men, to teach them about their bodies, about their sexual drive, and about what can happen, their rights and responsibilities with their own body. And I don't think that teaching them just to abstain helps because, uh, you know, it's been proven. Lots of kids have been born uh, post-abstinence uh, sex ed teaching. So, And, and um, one thing about, um, you know, that I find... It's stunning uh, with all the fervency and energy that goes into the the groups that are against abortion and that uh, put all this energy into that fight. You know, where are, why aren't they fighting for the children who are here, who are here now? More children are living in poverty than any other time in our nation. There are more children in poverty than elderly people. And and children not getting proper education. And we're not focusing on the children that are alive and with us right here on our planet. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely need to fix the environment and the resources before we bring any more children into a horrible, horrible environment. Well, right. And I think that we have to work on the religious indoctrination part of this where they're teaching them okay, your job is to have babies and plenty of them because that's what's destroying us is that, you know, for every atheist mind out there, there's 10 Christians procreating like bunny rabbits because, you know, Jesus and God said, okay, you're here to make babies. Well, I wish Jesus or God would have said, okay, you have to be responsible about the earth that you're destroying while you do it. Exactly. Right, and, you know, it's... If y'all don't mind, and uh, we'll we'll let him chime in a little bit on this. Sure. Carly, you there? Yeah, I'm here. I didn't know you were talking when I guess when I said unmuted or whatnot. Um, okay. I, I just wanted to touch on something that Rachel, with Rachel Wall mentioned. Um, and it kind, I kind of took it to heart, and it's because when you said, "How do we value life?" I think that everybody should have their own definition of what life is as well as a very objective one. So to have subjectiveness and objectiveness, and this is, is, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm going to tell you how I value life. I'm tired of people playing with my life. I'm tired of people playing games and money issues and religious bullshit with my life. And I'll tell you why. Because I lost already a mother, okay? I've already lost a sister to freaking disease I've been living with and fighting with, and I lost them at the age of 12 and 13, okay? I, have, I, I actually watched my mother die, okay, the day, in, in Kitty in a coma. I've seen my sister in a coma. I've seen the bad life. I'm a cancer survivor since age three. You guys want to check it out, MiamiHerald.com archives. Type in my name, Carlos Moore, okay? I'm tired of people playing with my life. I'm tired of people playing with the lives of the people I care about. And you know what? Because I'm such, I'm being dead serious. I'm such a freaking dead humanist, okay? So I help out people with a gas station. I pay for people's gas. And you know what's sad? I actually offered to buy a stupid drink for a girl. She looked at me with disgust as if I was trying to, like, ask her out. Fine. I'm not the most good-looking guy in the world, but don't look at me like I'm a piece of garbage. And you know what? When I told her I didn't want her name or her number, and I just wanted to be, do something nice for somebody... Then she let me. And then I had everybody behind me telling me I was a gentleman. I said, that's not being a gentleman. That's being human, helping people out. Because you know what? That $1.25 or $2 she's going to that drink could be the difference between a $150 freaking toll ticket. So when it comes down to valuing life, I think that right now I am a humanist. I am the kind of person. I sit here and I educate people. Okay? I do think that I go through from girl to girl to girl to girl to girl 
or from God, you know, whatever it could be, from person to person, friendship to friendship, and you don't think that I try to make an impact on people's lives, ask for freaking lupus. Because I've seen how fragile life is. And you know what? You're right. We don't know whether that kid in Africa or that kid in the womb is a Hitler or an Einstein. That's right. At the end of the day, at the day, at the end of the day, what they can be has nothing to do with their parents. It has Car- Carlos. Because Carlos. I think that I was not ra- no, 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 I was not raised in a Princeton Yale type of household. My father is a police officer retiree for 33 years. I myself was a cop. Okay, I spent four years. And you know what the sad thing is? We weren't well off. We were middle to upper class. Okay? My dad's a, a devoted Catholic. He's never changed, but he's also a skeptic by nature. And you know the greatest thing part is? I actually had to live for a good part of my life with an evangelical and loving Christian. My stepmother. Hey, Carlos. Day, Carlos. All let me stop you here for a second. Um, I want to I want to address that whole sanctity of life thing. I'm a humanist too, but I'm for the humans who already exist. I'm for seeing less suffering on their part. Um, I'm not going to worry about the humans that don't exist, won't exist. You know, the ones uh, that uh, nature decided they didn't need to exist because a woman had a miscarriage, um, and those can happen at any time as well as stillbirth. Uh, so I'm not going to worry about them, but I am going to worry about the seven billion people that are on this planet and their health and safety, because that comes first, okay? And if a woman says that she feels that she needs to have an abortion, I feel that her choice supersedes anything else, because it's her I care about. And that is humanism, because you know what? You can't say that every life that, that quote, unquote, should be born needs to be born, okay? Seven billion people on this planet, I think we're doing pretty good. We do need to take care of this planet. We do need to take care of our resources. And we, stop, we need to stop procreating like rabbits because basically when our, our world is overpopulated by us, what are we going to do? Do we then decide on death camps? Do we do, then decide on who, to, you know, who can survive based upon some silly uh, notion of genetic fitness? This is a reality. Abortion exists for a reason, and we should choose to use it because there are too many people on this planet already. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let me, you're, you're a biologist? Is that your field of study? Is that your degree? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so as a biologist, you understand the laws of nature and evolution and Dar- the, Darwin, the Darwin view of not just adaptation, but then nature, you know, as far as uh, natural selection, picking out who lives and who dies. So regardless of what we want the ch- child to live or die, evolution and nature and adaptation weeds out those people anyway. Whether we try or not, we cannot work on a scale that grand. Only nature does. Only life and the chaos that it brings weeds out what lives and what dies. So you can't right. be a hypocrite for oh. biology and say that you're going to have an active role in saving the planet when the planet will decide for itself who wants to save. Okay, can okay, I, uh, my, my, degree, my degree is in psychology, um, and yes, biology, uh, biology and nature will weed out the ones that are less fit, but people that are extremely fit physically are not fit mentally, and they're not fit emotionally, and those people are people that end up like Hitler. Again, the point, like, I think we are getting way off track here because of the things that you are arguing is the fact that if a woman chooses to have an abortion, then she knows what is best for her, she knows what is best for that child, and she knows that she can't provide it either emotionally, psychologically, or biologically. So really, like, the the whole thing of the nature weeding out, yeah, it weeds out the people that are not physically fit, but what if they're not mentally fit? If they also aren't psychologically fit or emotionally fit, then they go around killing people because they're antisocial and they get pleasure out of that. And I okay. hate to tell you, but you're wrong, because ad- adaptation is a huge hold role on, evolution. Hold on. Adaptation. Carlos, debate, Carlos, please, debate, please, slow down. Let me just say something here, okay? You want to talk about my being a biologist. Okay, so let me explain this to you. We know about natural selection. It will weed out the ones that are genetically unfit. That's what happens in miscarriages. Um, most women within the first week, you know, uh, about 89 of them out of 100 will have a miscarriage within the first five days because the fetus is not 
uh, genetically fit to continue growing. Now, when you talk about weeding out, uh, abortion is a good thing and a bad thing, um, and I can honestly look at it as a biologist. It's a good thing because of overpopulation, and once we face overpopulation, we face disease rates increasing. We face, uh, you know, devastating our, our world as it is. So we have to take care of our biosphere. Now, abortion is bad because we do eliminate some genetic uh, codes from our DNA line. However, you can't predict. Like I said before, uh, basically we can't determine who's genetically fit to survive. Nature does that. Uh, when it comes to HIV, we've now found out that 1% of the world population has uh, basically a protein that won't allow the, the HIV to replicate in their body. And this is because in history we actually faced something like HIV before. So they are resistant to it. And if HIV became a worldwide epidemic where we were all suffering from it, 1% of the population would survive. Okay. And that's what's happened through various viruses and bacteria that we face. Certain you're, amount of you're uh, not, the population you're not is sick. However, however, not, however, please let me finish. However, we can't determine that, and you can't say that that abortion that you had is going to be the sole survivor for our planet. That's not how it works. It usually works in groups. So having that abortion isn't going to affect all of humanity at once. Okay, you're right, absolutely right. You're 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 totally on the right in that end part. But let me say something to you. What you have pretty much told me is nothing new. I take into account everything that I I come across. And as far as that immunity goes, guess what? That's nothing new. We've known about it for at least 15 years now. In fact, my father has to call the TPR5 gene mutation. I know this. Really well, if it's not, not new, then you shouldn't disregard it because that's a very vital, I, important part of biology. It. No, no, no. What do you have? We have pills now. We have the Truvada medicine. That person taken in the past that now prevents HIV. That's not the point. The point is that one point or another, you're trying to rationalize emotions, and emotions are irrational. You have to be able to live with the decision of that abortion. Some women cannot live with that decision, and then they off themselves, or they go crazy, or they make it into a fucking spree, or drug, a drug new drug addiction. These and are you things can't that, assume that. that. You cannot back. say that women are all irresponsible. That's basically what Did you're I basing that? that on. The I principle know, no, that no, women no, no, are no, irresponsible no, no. with their bodies, and that is I'm absolutely gonna... flawed thinking. Okay, no, science is a really absolute. That the, a scientist does not deal in the absolute. I hate to tell you, I do not deal in the absolute. What I'm trying to do is I'm prevent. I'm trying to make this thought an idea, even if it's five percent. That's how Christianity started. Five percent, and then okay. it became and look, and look okay. how Christianity has ended up horribly. This has become okay. a yell fest about things that we wanted to concentrate on. It's a, truly a disruption of what I thought I was going to be de debating about because. This has become a reason or reason not to have an abortion. That's personal. No, it's it's about the no, woman. Hold on, Carla. You have got to stop interrupting. It is about a woman's choice. If the woman has an abortion, and yes, there is PDS, PTSD that happens from a, an abortion, emotions are irrational. They're not illogical. They are irrational. But then that woman, again, uh, survival of the fittest, is not fit enough to adapt to trauma. I had traumatic things happen to me as a child, and I didn't off myself because I'm stronger than that. A woman that off herself means that her brain was not developed enough to handle an abortion, and that's just a sad fact of survival of the fittest. But you are distracting and disrupting the debate that I thought that I was going to be having, which is the right to choose whether or not I want to do this or not, or whether or not any woman around the world is uh, cognitively aware enough and responsibly aware of enough of ha making this choice. And the fact that you're coming in, throwing all these side balls and, side balls and scapegoating is really getting my feminist fire going. And, Stephanie, I actually put Carlos on hold so that you could finish that um, <laughs> because he was being a little bit distracting. And I can bring him back in a second so that he can answer to that. Uh, however, this is not where I intended this to go, is a, a blame women for their use of their body. Um, exactly. uh, before, before I bring him back on, I want to say something about this whole situation. It's okay for men to go out and have sex with every woman that will put out for them, but then it's okay to blame the woman because she gets pregnant. It's okay for exactly. men to go out and not use condoms and get mm -hmm. the woman pregnant 
but then we want to blame her when she does get pregnant. That is, yep. that is absolutely abhorrent to me, that you would want to blame women, but you don't blame men. You don't ever mm-hmm. say, okay, why are guys not being responsible and using condoms? Why are guys not taking care to not get that woman pregnant? Right. Where is the blame for the men? I agree. They don't ever have to think about the decision of an abortion because their bodies aren't able to even have a baby. Yeah. They get right. to ejaculate right. and then leave, and women aren't able to have an orgasm and leave. Women are stuck with the responsibility, and then men want to blame them. And, and we live in a society where a man is heralded as macho if he can sleep with a few hundred women, and women are heralded as whores if they sleep with 20 guys. So, right. you know, this double standard is just a strike against women having a uterus. If I right. could give up having a uterus and still be the same woman, I would. Because I'll tell you, I get tired of men talking about my body and my biology as if they can dictate to me what I should and shouldn't be doing with it. And that's absurd. Right. Because I don't dictate when a man can come. He shouldn't dictate when I should be able to ovulate and when I shouldn't. Right. And I'll bring Carlos the man back on. Well, well, I would like to say before we bring Carlos back on, Stephanie, you're doing the right thing, though, speaking up against someone who's saying these things. And and whether or not this was the topic of conversation that we wanted to have, uh, the fact that we're having it is healthy. And, and I think both of you are doing a really good job stating your point, and that's what you need to keep doing. Agreed. Thank that's you. A, very well said, Jimmy. Very well said. And, and you know, that's one thing that we hadn't actually talked about and I hadn't actually weighed in on either is is the fact that men ultimately uh, don't have the weight of the responsibility of bearing that child uh, that women have. They don't bear that responsibility. And, and, and I... I, I'm hard pressed, and this may sound like, "Oh my God, were you a floozy or what?" But I don't even know who. I honestly don't know who the father was of the when I was 15. And when I think back, I just knew so little about sex and things like that. That that, uh, and it was really forced on me. I I don't recall saying, "Oh yes, let's do this thing," you know. Mm. Uh, and and um they're very persistent uh sometimes and so here i am i wind up pregnant and it's it's something that i have to deal with because he's not there he and and, and that's not the case all the time mind you it's not the case all the time but it but in many cases the the father of that child is noticeably absent and right. it it creates a hardship for um, yeah. that woman. That's also, you might have not known who the dad was, but I bet you those men were also, I mean, like, excuse me if I'm speaking out of term, but those men also probably didn't know if they got a woman pregnant who the mom, you know, like they were probably sleeping around right. too with multiple people, and it wasn't just you sleeping around with all these men that had just lost their virginity to you. Those men who were also sleeping around. Um, and touching on the responsibility part, I also think it's very skewed for a man not to wear a condom because it doesn't feel good, it's not as pleasurable, but yet no one thinks about um, the women that take birth control. It's very unpleasant. I just got back on birth control and threw up because of it and felt sick for three days straight just because my body was getting used to these artificial hormones that I'm putting myself through in order to be responsible of my reproductive system. Yet, uh, for the men mentality, and it doesn't go for all men, there are there are a lot of men out there that are responsible and will wear a condom because they are responsible. Um, but you do hear the consistency of least of, I don't wear a condom because it doesn't feel good. It's not as pleasurable. Well, so what? <laughs> you know, it has to be a humanist equal playing field. And I and I think too, uh, in, in defense of, of men out there, um, I don't think that men, and especially young men, I think that the the kid that I had sex with that got me pregnant, I don't think he set out to get me pregnant, and I don't think he no. uh, certainly didn't have that intention, nor did I. But I think he was just as ill-informed as I was, and I think that was part of his 
it's on both sides to a certain degree. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think that boys, young men, always uh, either know their options for protection. Mm-hmm. And and so, um, it, it, you know, I I really, really don't believe that, that men um, intentionally impregnate women. Um, oh, no. No. And, I hope that's not no. what I was leading well, to. I, I think right, that when right. it comes to our culture, that's not true. But I do know um, I have a lot of experience with other cultures. And for those men, uh, it's very masculine to uh, get women pregnant. So uh, in our culture, that, that probably is not the likelihood. But in other cultures, for men, that's like, you know, that's a hero's badge. You know, right. I've made so many kids. So yeah, we, we do have to them. be aware of that as well. Oh right, and and that is a that is a problem in those cultures too. They they mm-hmm. tend to overpopulate as well. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we we mentioned it before, but this ties back into it. That education is first and foremost. Um, educating the, the, both men and women about the reproductive consequences whenever you you know have sex and the risk of it. So. Right. Yeah, and. And it's responsibility on both sides of the line. If if men don't want women getting abortions, then men shouldn't be getting women pregnant. And I always preach this. Men should be wearing condoms. I don't care how it feels when you have sex with her. I don't care if it's uncomfortable. Um, It's your responsibility to take care of your body. And that goes for everyone, men and women along the line. And that's why I always preach about this religiously, (laughs) ha-ha, that Everybody has to be responsible, not just women. And men who blame women right. are the first ones to say, no, I don't want to use a condom because exactly. they know what they're up to and they know the chances of getting a woman pregnant. But they choose yeah. to put the blame on her because it's easier. And they and those men that, that tend to follow that mindset are usually the men that will walk away once they do get a woman pregnant instead of sticking around to help raise the child. Yeah, absolutely, and that's another problem that we face. Men can walk away, and sometimes women are drunk. Sometimes that does happen. It doesn't make her irresponsible. It makes her human, and and mm-hmm. even if that's the case, and she isn't aware of who the father would have been, um, you know, she's left to face this decision alone, and that's a tragic exactly. situation for any woman. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Okay, um, I, I just want to point something out. Um, it's always a two-way street. Everybody has to be willing to eat the humble pie. And I think that when you eat that humble pie, you become grows a person. So let, let me let me settle something. Yes, we can't deal in absolute. We can't say all men think this way or they don't think this way. Think of women. And you know what? I've heard more of the argument about condoms not feeling good on the women's side than men. I'm going to be dead on seriously. Maybe it's just the people I hang around with or I slept with. But I can tell you right now that at the end of the day, any education is just removing accountability. If you're telling me that you will remain ignorant because someone didn't teach you about sexual education, then there's a bigger problem here. I think that problem lies with the person who says that. And what I mean by that is that if you choose not to seek the information, if it's not given to you, then you're choosing willfully ignorant. And willful, willful ignorant, in my opinion, is worse than just having any kind of problem whatsoever because that's what hurts everybody and not just you. And yeah. I yeah, personally Carlos, am a late bloomer. I am a late let, bloomer. Let, 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 let me interrupt you for a second, Carlos. I, I will say this, though. The situation, I, I think what Terry's saying, she was 15 years old when that happened to her. Uh, that lack of education and, as you call it, the, the lack of desire to search out for the education, the education wasn't available. And that's the fight that we're having is, is we need to make that education more available. We need to teach sex ed in schools. We need to make sure that children know. And the fact is, is that they don't know, and they don't have, uh, they don't have that information available to them. So to say that, it, you're, you're coming at it from a one-sided point, but you're not making sense with it because if, they, if the no, information is not available, then they're not there. Okay, let, me, let me clarify that. What's in the past is in the past. Regardless of what education system is about, sex ed, which they do from time to time. I say, I went through, what, sixth grade, seventh grade, and got some kind of sex education as well as drug education. Um, 
But at the end of the day, whose responsibility is it to know about their own body and what happens with their own body? Is it really the education system's responsibility, accountability, being able to say that I'm at fault for something? Is what the problem here is in the United States and the world. We cannot, I'm sorry to say, we can't swallow our pride and say I fucked up. And that's on both ends, male and female, okay? That's on everybody, the child and the adult, the educator and the student, the politician and the citizen. There's no fucking accountability anymore. Everybody wants to point the damn finger at everybody else and not themselves. I'm tired of that nonsense. If you can't say that you, you can't must jump the balls, I'm sorry to say that, but if you can't must have that kind of, you know, that kind of courage to say, hey, listen, I screwed up, I'm admitting to my fault, and I'm going to do better next time, then that's where you grow. If you can't do it, then you know what? Okay. I don't know what to tell Carlos. anybody. Carlos, but that's what abortion is. It, it's saying, okay, I fucked up, and I'll do better next time. Most women don't right. use it as a revolving door system. I, and also, I'm not I think we're that people all using the evolving door. I'm saying the education system cannot be blamed for the increase of abortions because I didn't get taught shit. And I, you know what? I waited. To, I have no problem with abortion. I have. The, I, it sounds like you do. You have a problem with abortion. I, I have, have no, no problem, problem with abortion. I don't care if every woman on this earth wants to get an abortion. It is her body and her right to take care yes. of her body as she sees and fit. And I agree. And and, and no man should be out there pointing a finger at her, telling her, no, you need to be more responsible. Everyone needs to be more responsible. But if they're not, hey, you feel like getting an abortion, go get an abortion. Do the world a favor because I'll tell you what, there's not enough social programs to take care of the children that are abused, the children that have parents who do drugs, the children that face having no home of their own. I mean, you look at the crisis the world is in, you can't complain about abortion. You need to start complaining about the children who are born who are going to suffer their whole life through. I mean, what, what is the quality of life? We, we keep talking about the quantity. We want all these babies to be born. But what about the quality of life? Don't people deserve that? Where is that exactly. at in this equation? Okay, but that's irrelevant to my discussion. What I was trying to tell you is that you guys were aiming at the education system being the, one of the main causes as to why women and men are so uninformed that they have they, they make these ill-informed decisions. And because of Your paradox argument is absolutely outrageous. You're talking about women and, ch- women and men that aren't informed. Information comes from education. So if they're saying they're and not informed because of the education system, then that's why they're not informed, because the education system sucks. I don't know if you heard me before, but I went to a Catholic school where the education system did not tell me that I could get an STD or told me that I could get pregnant from the pull-out system. It told me just to not have sex. That's all it said, not to have sex. That does not work, because whenever I decided to have sex, I didn't know about condoms. I didn't know about birth control. I didn't even know what chlamydia was. So I didn't make the right responsible choice due to education. And that is the problem. That is where the finger should be pointed. It's at the education system. Absolutely. I agree with you. And we have just a couple minutes left, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get the show wrapped up. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for being here, and I know next week uh, one of the things that we're going to do is we have, uh, we're going to talk about gay rights and rights to equal marriage opportunity. So I hope that you guys will join us for that. And I want to thank you, Stephanie, Terry, everybody, for joining us today. It's been great having you on. Yes, yes it has. <clears throat> and hopefully next week we'll actually get to stay on topic. This has been a great week. Great conversation, everyone that called in. Thank you so much, um, and that's the that's the joy of a live show. We actually get to uh, let the show evolve as people call in, and this was a good one. So, looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah, and we'll be back again next week, everybody, at 4 p.m. And you can look for us then. And until then, uh, everybody, take care and stay safe. Okay. Bye.